the, the high street is something which has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. And of course, in that time, it's been able to adapt and change. Old industries die away, new things come forward. The market adapts. Hello and welcome to the IEA's YouTube channel. I'm Annabelle Denham, I'm Director of Communications here at the Institute of Economic Affairs and I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Len Shackleton, who is our Editorial and Research Fellow and a Professor of Economics at the University of Buckingham. And Len is joining me today to discuss the future of our beleaguered high streets. So more than 17,000 shops shut in 2022 in what was described as the worst year for retail in half a decade. Retail sales fell in real terms in 2022. Footfall on Britain's high streets uh, plummeted after the Christmas period. Inflation is forcing Brits to really rein in their spending and the cost of living crisis uh, is showing very little sign of abating. So it all appears to spell pretty bad news for Britain's high streets, but could the picture be a little bit more mixed, even if the diagnosis of the problem is accurate? Are there things that governments or even local councils can do to uh, improve the prognosis? So Len, let's start by uh, asking you your assessment of where things are. And I'm just going to read you a few headlines of articles that you've written over the last two to three years. In April 2020, for our high streets, there will be no return to normal anytime soon. In April 2021, even with restrictions lifted, prospects for the high streets are grim. And in March last year, an online sales tax will do nothing to improve our dreary high streets. Do you stand by your word, or could it be that the devil really is in the detail? Let's not forget that while some household names like Jules went into administration, Greg's had a very good year. What are your yes, thoughts? Yes, people are eating lots of pies. It's, uh, that, that is not in pies? itself perhaps uh, sufficient to drive the high street recovery. But there are, I mean, there are some, there are some signs, to be fair. There's been a growth of, of uh, leisure, uh, leisure locations on, on former high streets. Uh, there's, there's a recovery of the nighttime economy, uh, you know, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, there is stuff going on, but the, 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 the high street is something which has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. And of course, in that time, it's been able to adapt and change. If we go back to sort of the early Victorian period, you'd have found on the high street a whole mix of things which you would never find these days. Small manufacturers, dairies, stables, all sorts of things which are, are no longer there. Uh, over time, uh, you know, the, the market adapts. People... Uh, decide they want to do different things. Old industries die away, new things come forward. Um, in the uh, earlier part of the 20th century, we had the, the growth of, um, uh, of, of, of um, um, shops which were selling groceries in a, in a way which hadn't been done before. And the rise of people at Lipton's and so on who started this kind of thing. Um, but we're in a, diff a rather difficult situation these days because ever since the Second World War, um, we've had planning of, of high streets. And there are four different uses which you have for, for um, premises. You know, you have ones for shops, you have ones for um, leisure activities, uh, housing and so forth. And it's difficult to move between these categories without a great deal of legal effort mm. and, and, and expense in doing so. And I think one of the things which we ought to do is liberalise this and allow uh, change of use on, on, on a much, uh, uh, you know, much more readily. I mean, to take one example, um, one of the problems has been the disappearance of, of big anchor retailers, um, you, you know, the Debenhams mm. and, and so forth. We're, we're, we're withdrawing from, particularly from smaller towns. This leaves. Uh, huge amounts of space which aren't easily adaptable to other retail needs. Mm. Uh, for example, I read recently that uh, BHS, British Home Stores, it went bust in, what, 2016 or something like that, six years ago. Over half their retail space is still empty because essentially the, these are large buildings which have no obvious uh, use for small retailers sure. and so on. Uh, they could be adapted for housing, they could be adapted for offices, but this is actually difficult to do within the existing planning system. So I think that's one of the things which, which we could do going forward. 
Do you think that retailers have been too slow to adapt? So, of course, uh, 10, 20, 30 years ago, we saw this move from high streets for larger retailers to out-of-town shopping centres. Mm, and I remember mm. when there was this, we saw this rise of online retail that companies like Toys R Us were asking the government if there was some kind of support and we heard lots about how the government might be able to level the playing field. But nonetheless, do you think that with the gift of hindsight, retailers really should have foreseen the rise of internet shopping and found ways of adapting, albeit, you know, accepting that that would be very challenging if you've got these large incumbents trying to compete with more nimble new, uh, new entrants. Yeah, but nobody can foresee the future, Annabelle. I mean, um, uh, I, I, I wrote a thing for the IA in, in 1996 uh, where I, I more or less dismissed the future of online retailing. I, admittedly, it was in a very early stage of development. The internet had only just started and so forth. But there were lots of problems uh, which, uh, you know, which have now been resolved in terms of deliveries, uh, in terms of uh, are people going to be in when things are delivered, that sort of thing, which I think many in the, in the retail uh, industry didn't, you know, didn't anticipate that, 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 that this mm. would happen. I certainly didn't. So um, you, you can't really blame, uh, <laughs> you can't really blame business not being able to, to foresee the future. Sure. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, I mean, it's interesting, you know, people throw this, this uh, comparison of online retailing and bricks and mortar retailing. But of course, the, the reality is they're beginning to merge a little bit mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, no uh, big re retailer is now solely bricks and mortar. Sure. Uh, and, and many of the online businesses are setting up premises where you can inspect goods and collect goods mm. and things like this. So there, you know, there is a, an interplay between these things. Um, again, it's difficult to see quite what the future holds in this respect. Um, a couple of years ago, during, during lockdown, we were all talking about, well, online is just going to completely sweep the board. Mm. Nobody's going to go out to shops. Mm. That hasn't happened, and in fact, um, online retailing fell back last year sure. uh, as people were routing about much more than they have been during during COVID, obviously. Um, so, yeah, you can't you can't tell the future. So now probably seems like a good time because you touched on it there to discuss the online sales tax. One of the mm. objections mm -hmm. to it is the fact that most retailers now have some sort of online presence, so they're going to be feeling the pressure from both sides if they are both having to pay business rates um, but also some sort of online sales tax. What other issues are there with the way in which the government is perhaps trying to even the playing field between bricks and mortar retailers and e-commerce? Yeah, well the, the online sales tax was uh, I think a bit of a dead end. Uh, when it was fully costed it was only going to bring in two or three billion or something of that order whereas business rates uh, bring in a, a, a huge multiple of that figure. So uh, it wasn't going to replace business rates. It might have been a partial offset, but as mm. you say, uh, you know, if, if a business is partly in, in, in uh, online and partly in bricks and mortar, then it's, you know, robbing Peter to pay Paul in a sure. sense to, to, to do this. What else could the government do? Well, of course, it has shoveled quite a lot of money into, you know, better sh these various funds which were, uh, have been set up under successive governments to to help the high street. I think about a billion pounds has actually been spent to no very great effect as, as far as I can see. That is street furniture has been improved and yeah. hanging streets baskets. have been spruced. Hanging baskets, yes, those wonderful uh, things which bedeck our high streets. Um, yeah, but it really hasn't fundamentally changed the, the, situ the situation. The high street does need to change. Um, but you know, there, there, you painted me as being very pessimistic earlier on, and I go, yeah. As far as tradition, the traditional high street, very much in inverted commas, of course, sure. because the, the the traditional high street, which most of us are familiar with, where you've got a Boots and a W H Smiths and all this lot, you know, uh, that was really a product of uh, really from the early 1960s onwards. Mm. You know, prior to that, it was still very much small independent butchers. Uh, you know, uh, greengrocers, that kind of thing. When I was a very small child, and I am exceedingly ancient, uh, but as a very small child, I used to go round with my mother shopping, you know, and you'd have to go to half a dozen shops 
to get the the day shot. We didn't have a fridge, you know. Uh, everything had to be bought on the day. So you go uh, go and buy some bacon there. You buy some fish there. You buy some bread there, and so forth. And um, that disappeared, of course, with the advent of supermarkets and and and, and uh, uh, fridges and freezers, uh, which which uh, opened up options for people. So their shopping patterns changed, and shopping patterns will continue to mm. change. Um, I, I say what we need to do is is to enable our, our um, retailers to be flexible, to, to shift resources from one area to another, to bring into the high street things which weren't there before, like lots of, lots of um, housing, perhaps local government buildings. Uh, in, in South End, uh, it looks pretty hideous, but they've put a job centre in on the main yep. street, and that's, that's quite useful. Previously, the job centre was about half a mile up the road. Uh, you know, you had, you had to trog out there. Sure, now sure. there's footfall on, on, on the high street mm. and so forth. So it's there are better things. Better than boarded up shops. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, it might not be very attractive. Um, the other, the other thing, of course, which tends to blight our high streets is is charity mm. shops. Mm. And I've, I've kind of raved about this on previous occasions, but uh, it's it's a bit of a fig. You know, there are about ten thousand, eleven thousand charity shops on our high streets, mm. and they get on there because of. Uh, 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 because of the um, uh, concessions which are offered to sure. charities. Uh, and, and it fits in with, uh, suppose you're a, a, a landlord of, 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 of premises, uh, of shops, um, you, you, you can't find anybody for them. After three months, you have to start paying business rates on them. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you, you bring in a charity shop on, on a short-term lease. Um, they, in turn, they only have to pay 20% uh, of rates, yep. right? So it's a big benefit to them. They also, uh, they don't pay VAT, they get deals on electricity and all sorts of stuff. So they, you can bring in these charity shops, uh, whereas small, uh, you know, startups, uh, pop-up shops and things like that would have to pay the full whack. Mm. So it, it, it gives an artificial advantage to charities, which is why we have so many of these things clogging up our high streets. And they do look hideous. I mean, one or two of them may be, but when you see, uh, as I've seen it in, in some uh, places outside London, where you have six of these things mm. in the space of 50 yards, I mean, it is not sending out the idea of a vibrant shopping experience. Sure. You know, it's old clothes and bits of furniture and stuff like that. And how else would you reform business rates? Do you have some sympathy with those who uh, advocate a land value tax, for instance? Well, of course, that's an interesting idea um, because, uh, you know, the, the, the short term fix of cutting uh, business rates sounds like a good idea. But, uh, you know, e economists always say that, the, the, you know, that the, the rents are determined by what people sure. can afford to pay. So if they, can, if, if they don't have to pay business rates, mm. they can afford to pay more rents and therefore uh, rental yeah. uh, so the rents rise. Of the tax so falls on landlords rather it, it falls on landlords yeah. rather than on, 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 on businesses. Um, so the idea of a, a, a land value tax, you know, this is something which has been knocking around. Henry George in the 19th century had this idea of the, the single tax. Mm. This was the thing which would make, uh, make all the difference. The Lib Dems have, have, have been flogging this idea for years uh, without getting very much purchase on it, but it is something which we, we, we perhaps might consider. Um, the Treasury, of course, uh, is very reluctant to change any, any uh, existing tax, particularly one which brings in large sure. amounts of money like business rates do. So I, I, don't, uh, I don't expect any change soon on this. So you talked about changing shopping habits, but of course, at the same time, we've got changing working habits, mm, which has been massively yes, indeed, accelerated yeah. by the coronavirus pandemic and working from home and other forms of flexible working have become a bit more normalised uh, to the extent that City AM announced this week it wouldn't be putting out a print edition on a Friday. Uh, so I just wonder, there's obviously massive variation between city centres and uh, town high streets. And I wonder if there are any policy changes that should really be introduced around that um, to, to either support hollowed out city centres or indeed perhaps on the local council level, making it more easy for people to come into town centres so mm -hmm. that they can do do their shopping and park and these sorts of things. Yeah, uh, of, of course it is, uh, as with so many things uh, when, you, when you talk about the economy, it's an ill win that, mm. you know, um, 
because uh, the loss to city centres has to some degree been offset by uh, smaller towns, commuter towns, and so on. Don't know what it's like in Harpenden, but uh, you, know, you know there are there are places around London where um, you know retail is actually doing better than yep. it was uh, because people are around more often. Mm. Um, well, so in both Harpenden and Shrewsbury, Ness, according to the BBC Postcode Tracker, which came out in December, retail levels have stayed about the same, but we've mm. both got more. Uh, I think Harpenden has got more cafes and restaurants, and yes. Shrewsbury Ness yeah. has more beauty, some nail salons, hair salons. Yes, the, in Essex, but the, both there's are a lot of people with yeah. nails and tattoos and stuff, yes. It's but both are experiences, aren't they? Yes. Rather, the people yeah. are going out yeah. for the experience rather than the product. Sorry, carry on. No, that's that's absolutely right. And and, and that uh, is a, I, uh, it's a positive development, mm. you know, that, that um, if if we're not if we if we're not buying so many things on on the high street, then if we're offering more services and these have been taken up, personal services which can't you know you can't have your nails done at home very sure. easily, uh, you can't do them on Zoom or no. whatever you know. So um, that's that's the positive development. Changes in in taste, changes in uh, attitudes to, to to things, and work at home, working from home. Um, well, it's a bit early to say, in a sense, because we're seeing only the upside, really, of working, mm. working from home at the moment. Uh, the the, the long-running problem in the British economy of low productivity uh, is, is, is the issue which governments really need to focus on. And whether making it easier for people to work at home, as, you know, as the Labour Party, for example, with its uh, the policies which it's putting forward at the moment, whether that is actually going to be a positive development for productivity and for output and therefore for real income mm. uh, is a different, uh, different matter. Um, and I just wanted to talk a bit about the regional variation. Mm. The British Retail yeah. Consortium recently reported that London, uh, the south east and the east of England had the lowest vacancy rates. The highest um, uh, rates were at the vacancy rates were in the north east, followed by Wales and the west. Midlands. And so again, I ask, you know, is there anything that government, which let's not forget under Boris Johnson, at least, was absolutely obsessed with this idea of levelling up, could be doing to boost um, retail in those areas where vacancy rates are their highest? Or does it just need to implement policies like those you've already mentioned across the board? And hopefully that will lead to some benefits in those in those areas. Well, yeah, I mean, you won't be surprised to, to learn that I'm sceptical of the idea that governments can shovel money at a problem and resolve it. Um, you know, I, I say the, the, the development of high streets over time is an organic development. It, it arises through hundreds of thousands of decisions by consumers, by, by small businesses, by people sitting in um, top offices and determining which you know, how many branches of Marks and Spencer there should be. And so there's all this kind of stuff mm. is going on. And, uh, you know, governments like to be seen to be doing something. And they like to say, well, we've given a, a billion pounds to improving the high street sure. and so on. We've got more hanging baskets. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, this, this is progress. Yep, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, um, but uh, it's, it's very difficult to see what the gov how the government can outguess the market in, in, in these kind of situations. As I say, what it ought to be doing is facilitating changes of use mm. of buildings uh, as, as, you know, changes of uh, behaviour, of, of, of lifestyles, etc. happens, then we ought to be able to accommodate these mm. or the, 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 you know, um, decision makers ought to be able, able to accommodate these. But the government, I don't know that what the government can do. I mean, there are things which I guess it can do. It can, it can take some civil service jobs out of out of London. And this has not been very successful sure. in the past. There have been some examples. Leeds has gained quite a bit from it. But there are other places like when they took the, the, the wonderful Office for National Statistics, which we, we, we make a, a lot of use of, they moved that out to Newport in, in Wales. Uh, and... Um, that didn't have any kind of multiplier effects sure. on the local economy, um, uh, which is what you tend mm. to want from these kinds of things. What about when the BBC moved to Salford? Did that have any impact? Uh, well, it, it meant that a lot of people 
uh, move backwards and forwards between London and Salford. Uh, no, to, to be fair, Salford has developed some, um, uh, you know, some ancillary media industries around mm. there and so forth. Um, but it's difficult to say what would have happened. You know, what is what is the uh, uh, the comparator situation? Yeah. What would have happened otherwise? I mean, there are other reasons why Salford might have developed uh, new industries and yeah. so forth. And um, but yeah, I, I mean, there are there are things like that which the government can do, which will have a defined effect. But more generally, sort of whacking out grants and things to. Oh, we've got a bright business idea. Give us, give us lots of money. Mm. Um, why? No, I don't think so. Um, you talked about change of use. What do you think is preventing the government from making that more easy? And why are councils, for instance, some councils, so opposed to permitted development rights? Well, uh, local local councils may feel that they're not going. You know, they're losing rates mm. by doing this. Um, uh, th th there's often a lot of nimbyism around this as well, you know, that do you want uh, the, all these, uh, a lot of social housing, for example, do you want that in this area? Sure. Um, there are also problems with congestion, you know, uh, one thing we haven't touched on, of course, is one of the reasons why the high street is, uh, is facing difficult times, it's very difficult to park anywhere yeah. near it, you yeah. know. Um, and, and the idea that you could, you know, the 15-minute city or 15-minute town, which is being talked about wherever they should be within walking distance, um, that isn't going to happen very easily. Um, um, so, yeah, the, the, there are issues like that which prevent local authorities perhaps being as positive as they might be to changes of this kind. I mean, d make it easier for people to park certainly makes sense if you're a high street retailer, but of course it goes against the government's green agenda, which a lot of local councils subscribe to. So I don't know how it marries the two. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, at this stage, you know, these there are these kind of visionary things about, you know, uh, nobody will own a car, you'll have these electric Uber type things moving around mm. uh, uh, autonomously. Drones. D drones, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> there may be some kind of technical fix like this, but it isn't going to happen soon or easily, mm. I think. Um, as I say, they, they, I think local authorities could be more positive about the, the, the kind of changes and just letting the, the market rip in a sense. Mm -hmm. Let's see what happens uh, in a spontaneous. Uh, development rather than something which somebody, uh, some planner somewhere decides well, we're going to have this, this and this. Well I think that just about covers it. Thank you very much for joining me. Uh, Len, thank you to those who are watching. If you enjoyed this video please do like and don't forget to subscribe to the IEA London YouTube channel and if you really like our content do consider becoming a donor on IEA Patreon. We will put uh, a link to uh, that in the show notes underneath this video. Thanks again. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way, you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast.